know that you know. Well, it's so good to see you this morning in all the rain, and you still came, and I so appreciate you doing it. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11? 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. By the way, this would have been a great day to ride the shuttle. You just drive up to that little shuttle bus, jump inside, and you are covered from then on out. So if you haven't, if you haven't tried it, you ought to try it in the next few weeks. And especially on a Sunday, it rains because the rain is the big thing for that shuttle bus. Well, how many of you have heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys? Anybody here? Yeah, we've heard that, haven't we? Two families that lived in uh, the latter part of the 1800s, 1878, they got mad at each other. They got mad at each other because they had a difference of opinion about a pig. A pig. And it grew to be a war between two families. And the end result is for 12 years they were in this war. 12 years. And 12 people died as a result of three Hatfields, seven McCoys, and two people just walking by at the wrong time. I mean, it didn't have anything to do with anything. They just walked by in the wrong place, wrong time. Both of them killed because of the hatred between these two families. These two families, over a pig, ended up killing 12 people. So my question to you is, who are you mad at? Did they hurt your feelings? Did they disappoint you? Are you jealous? Who are you mad at? Who have you got a broken relationship with? That's what I want to talk to you about today because that is the application, the greatest application, I think, of this passage of Scripture. How do we restore a broken relationship? How do you do that? Maybe you're right in the middle of one. Maybe you're really struggling with somebody. What do you do now? You're, you're a Christian. You love God. You want to do the right thing. What is it? How do you do it? We're going to talk about that today. You found the passage. Let's take a look. 1 John chapter 3 and beginning in verse 11. Listen to what he says. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I'm going to stop for just a moment. There's five chapters in 1 John and four chapters. In four of the five chapters, he talks about the issue of love. I mean, we can't get, can't get away from it. All the way as we're going through this book, it just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back, and he intends for that to be the case. In fact, he intends to make sure we understand that the, the, greatest, the greatest evidence that we truly know Jesus Christ, that we truly love God, is not our convictions, not our morality. The greatest evidence that we know God is our love. He's trying to make sure we understand this. Now, there's everything right about convictions and everything right about morality, but the greatest demonstration that we know Jesus is our love. Remember what Jesus said? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you what? Have love toward each other. I guess I'm wondering today, is, is this how people that don't know God today know us as Christ followers? Wow, but look at their love. Is that how we're known? He says that you love one another. Not, verse 12, as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brethren, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
We know love by this, that Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for each other. Let's pray. Lord, this is one of the toughest passages to really own, to really wear in our everyday life. This is one of the toughest ones. So God, open our heart today. Show us who we can be. Show us how we can live. Show us how you want us to be and live. And be that force, be that strength in us to live out these words. And Lord, if there are people in our lives that we have a broken relationship with, would you go to work in our heart today? Would you keep bringing them back to our minds as we talk through what you say in this passage? And would you bring a resolve in our heart to get them right? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing as we walk through the passage together is that it's pretty obvious that God is saying to us, I don't want you to live the way of Cain, the way of Cain. He brings up Cain and Abel in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. And, you know, it's Genesis chapter 4, and it's probably been a long time. You may recognize Cain and Abel, but maybe it's been a while since you've read their story. So let's go back and look. Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth the man. Most of the translations say amen, and it makes sense that they do that. But actually, the Hebrew actually says the man. And I think it's there for a reason. I think that she was saying the man because she was hoping that he would be the answer to the promise that God had given to Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis when they had sinned. They were, they, they were born, they were made rather, they were created absolutely perfect, sinless, but they sinned before God. And when they sinned, they fell in that relationship with God. And in the explanation of what happens in chapter 3, God gives to them a promise of a promised one who was coming. It is the very first promise that God give, gave to us of the Messiah coming. And I believe that what, what uh, Eve is saying is, is that I'm wanting this. Oh, God, I'm wanting this to be the man, the one, this promised one that you are going to bring that rescues us. But Cain was no Messiah. And so it says in verse 2, and later she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel kept flocks. Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked down with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. And his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, then sin is crouching at the door and will destroy you. It will begin to own your life. It will end up ruining your life. So you must master it. And now Cain said to his brother Abel. I mean, Cain doesn't even reply to God. He goes to his brother Abel and says, Hey, brother, you want to go out in the field and, hey, let's just spend some time together. And when they were out there, he lifted up a knife and killed his brother Abel. I want us to think about these two guys for just a moment. And if you think about it, um, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4 that, that Adam and Eve had a whole slew of kids. 
They didn't just have three sons that are mentioned in the book of Genesis. They actually had a ton of sons and daughters, and we don't know the order of them. We suspect that Cain was probably the firstborn and probably for sure the firstborn son, but we don't know even the order of any of these children. How many children came in between Adam, I mean, uh, uh, Cain and Abel? We don't know. We don't have any of that information. He mentions three of the sons simply because these three sons fit in the narrative that Moses is laying out in the book of Genesis. That's why we know about these three guys. But there are all kinds of daughters or all kinds of sons, which is the answer to the question, who did Cain marry? Well, he married his sister. Well, there is two guys in the story, Cain and Abel, and both of these guys came from the same family. Both of them were sinners. Both of them knew they were going to die physically because of their sin. Both of them had the same opportunities, the same advantages. They were taught the very same things from their parents. Both of them brought an offering to God. Now, when Abel brought the offering to God, he did exactly what God had told him to do. And he brought that offering exactly as God had told him to do, and God accepted the offering. When Cain brought his offering to the Lord, though God had told him exactly what to do, Cain had decided, I'm not going to do that thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. I, I'm going to express myself the way I want to express myself. And he brought his offering in the way that he wanted to bring it. And God did not accept his offering. Can I tell you that people have been doing this ever since? You know, I, I've got my own way to get to God. I've got my own thing. God and I have got our own thing going. But the truth is, God's only got one thing going. And the only thing he's got going is the very same thing he had going during that same time with Cain and Abel. It is only coming to God through blood, through a sacrifice, through the offering of blood. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And all through the Old Testament and all through the New Testament, there was coming to God through the sacrifice of blood. All of those things only looked forward to the time when his son would come and he would die as the ultimate sacrifice for us. And still today, we can only come to God through the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Can't come another way. People are still trying, but you can't get to God that way. And this is the experience of Cain and Abel. And so now... Cain is so mad. He is so angry. First of all, he's embarrassed. He's the firstborn more than likely. And here is his younger brother, and his younger brother's accepted, and he is not. He is embarrassed, and he's jealous, and he's mad at God. And he doesn't say just angry. He says he's very angry. This is to the point of hatred that he has toward God and now toward his brother, and he decides in his anger he will kill his brother, and he does. So my question to you is, who are you mad at? You say, well, at least I haven't killed anybody yet. Well, this is good. I'm glad you haven't. But did you know that the Bible talks about murder in a way that is very different than we usually think. Listen to what he says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Now, he is just simply repeating Jesus. You see, it was Jesus who first talked about this issue. Notice what he says in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. You're going to have to stand before God, and you're going to be judged by God on the basis of that act of murder. But Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who hates his brother will be subject to judgment, meaning the same judgment. Jesus is saying that hatred is murder of the heart. The reason is because Jesus knew something about sin that sometimes we even forget today, and that is we think that sin is something that we 
do. We Some outside activity and we give ourselves to sin, but actually sin begins inside. Sin of the heart is just as much sin. And Jesus is saying to us, look, and in fact, not just in this example, but in others he, just, he gives in the same passage, it is a sin of the heart. It starts right here. And even while you're contemplating, you're thinking about it, you're building this hatred toward another person, God considers that murder of the heart. Here is Cain, and he murders But what about you? Are you murdering in the heart? Now, I'm going to ask you to pause for just a second, and I want to chase a rabbit if I could. And I got a reason for it, and I had intended to chase it at the very beginning. And so the way I want to begin doing that is to take a look at a passage of Scripture that we know as the love chapter. This passage of Scripture is oftentimes used in wedding ceremonies. In fact, I pretty much always do. Uh, Kathy and my uh, wedding ceremony, we this passage of scripture, part of the passage at least, was read. And how many of you? How, how many of you in your wedding, if you're married, in your wedding ceremony was a part of the love chapter used? Just raise your hand. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. But what happens oftentimes in a marriage is though we start with the love chapter in mind, very quickly we begin to forget all about what it actually says. I know you've read this. I know you've heard it. But I'm going to ask you to do your very best to try to hear it this morning as though for the first time. Listen to what he says. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And I have a faith that is capable of moving mountains, but I have not love. I am, in the core of my being, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor, I surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Now, I want you to stop for just a moment and think about what he's saying. No matter how talented you are, no matter all the things that you accomplish with your life, no matter how much people congratulate you for all the things you've done, no matter what you possess or what you have done or what you are capable of, you and I can get to the end of our life and it really amounts to nothing. It's not about the things we accomplish and the awards we win. He says, really the big thing is, did you really learn how to love? Did you really grasp what it means to love another person and other people in your life? So what is this love? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This is not a cotton candy kind of love. In our culture, the word love is thrown around every time you turn around, and it's syrupy and sugary, and oftentimes it's just totally ridiculous. This is not a Disney kind of love. It's not a Disney kind of marriage, the kind of marriage love that the Bible talks about. This is a hard love. This is a near impossible kind of love. This this is a life-changing love. This is a courageous love, a humble love. This is a gut-wrenching kind of love. This is the kind of love that rises above. This is the kind of love that puts others first. This is the kind of love that is always second. This is the kind of love that is willing to see another person's perspective, even though I already know I disagree with it, but I will listen because I love you. This last week, I met 
a, a person uh, that I had never met before. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. But we were in a situation which we were just having a conversation. And in the midst of the conversation, uh, we were talking about Kathy and I, how long we'd been married and that sort of thing. And she said to me, wow. I mean, what is, what is the secret of staying married for, for that length of time? What, what's the secret to that? Well, I never said this before. I'd never even thought this before, but it just, I mean, it came out. I'd never said it like this. But I said to her, I think it is because both of us have kept growing up the whole time we've been married. Well, then there is this 15-second, 20-second silence that happens. And, you know, in any conversation, that's like, whoa, this is getting very uncomfortable. So I was about to break the silence when she then said, I don't understand what you just said at all. What does that mean? And I said, well, it means that marriage has got to be the hardest thing that anybody ever does. It is that way for every marriage. It's the toughest kind of relationship in which you get to the deepest level of love. It's, it's the intention of it. And I said, we're all pretty immature. I said, I, I'm, I've really, when we got married, very immature and still trying to get past it. And I said, but what has to happen is, is that every year that you're married, every day you're married, you have to keep growing up you got to keep working on being less selfish, to be selfless, to give yourself away, to put someone else ahead of you, to care about someone more than you care about yourself even. You have to keep growing up, and it takes both people doing it. And the more you grow up, the deeper your love grows for each other. And I said, I've got to be honest with you. My wife is way ahead of me and always has been. But I'm I'm trying to get up there caught up with her. We just kept growing up. I honestly believe this is the key to any relationship, not just marriage. I mean, marriage, you're right there together, and it it is the great thing that God... God intended marriage to take us to a level of love that was the deepest level of love. He intended marriage to do that. He intended it to to be tough and to go through the struggle and build that kind of marriage. He intended that. But there are other relationships in our life, and what He intends us to do in those relationships is keep growing up. So that whether we're married or we're single, If we can reach this 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love, and this is a fill-in-the-blank thing, if we can keep moving in this 1 Corinthians chapter 13 kind of love, we will actually accomplish one of the great goals that God intended for our life to accomplish, and that is mature love. And it is a lifelong process in which we grow deeper and deeper and deeper into love with another person. It is a mature kind of love. And God is calling you and I to be in the midst of that. And there are different relationships He gives to us to allow us to have the setting in which we keep growing up. Now, I've chased the rabbit And it's for a reason, but now back to Cain and Abel. What should Cain have done? He knows that God has rejected his offering. This is the the moment. What should he have done? Instead of getting angry, embarrassed, and jealous of Abel, instead of being furious with God, so bitter, angry at God and his brother that he kills his brother, what should he have done? Well, it's so obvious. He should have said, I blew it. I messed up. I came in the way that I wanted to come. I refused to come the way you told me to come. I'm coming to you and I'm confessing I messed up. 
I was wrong. I sinned, and I'm confessing that, and I'm coming back to you, God, and I'm asking your forgiveness. He should have said to his brother, see, this was the problem. It was the younger brother. He should have humbled himself and said to his younger brother, you have really set an example I want to reach. I want to thank you. He should have humbled himself. But here's what happens. Here's what happens in every conflict that keeps right on going. It is pride that keeps any conflict going to the point of hatred in our heart for that other person. It is pride and stubbornness in our heart that keeps that relationship broken. Why does a husband and wife, why is it that there's just every day fight, 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 fight? It's pride, it's stubbornness, and an unwillingness to be broken of it. Why, why parents and children fight, fight all the time? It is pride, and it's stubbornness, and an unwillingness to be broken of it. Why is it problems between neighbors and problems between church members, and you pass other people in the hallway, and you ignore them, and, and, and it's this cold war, and and someone else in your life, maybe somebody at work or someone that's a member of your extended family, I want nothing to do with you, and, and you just keep right on barreling through. It is pride and stubbornness. This is what happened with them. And in a relationship in which we keep hanging on to our pride, we are going the way of Cain. This is what John is illustrating in the passage. We've chosen the way of Cain. But he says instead of choosing the way of Cain, how about choosing the way of Christ? 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for each other. You know, it struck me as I was reading this that this is 1 John 3.16. There is John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16. And if you think about it, it's amazing. It's just uncanny. Both of the verses are talking about the same theme. You, you, I, I didn't write out John 3.16 for you because I really wasn't planning to do this until I got into the first service, and now I'm doing it every service. But I'm asking you to help me. You know John 3.16. Let's do our best, and let's quote John 3.16 together. Just, just uh, jump in wherever you can if you're not quite sure. You ready? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you think about this, John 3.16 is about God loving us and showing that love through sending his son who dies on the cross for us. And then if you look at 1 John 3.16, it's amazing. It is about love. And it is about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us, laying his life out for us. But 1 John 3.16 says something that John 3.16 doesn't say. It takes it to the next step, and notice the next step it takes it to. And we ought to lay down our lives for each other. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8 takes that idea and expands it out for us so that we better understand it. What does it mean to lay down our lives for each other? Well, notice what he says in Philippians 2, beginning verse 5. Your attitude. This is where it all starts. It's either a pride attitude, it's either a stubbornness attitude, or it's a yielding attitude. Your attitude should be the same of, of that of Christ Jesus. It's all in the attitude who, being in very nature God. He is not talking about an average human being. He's not talking about a good man, a good prophet, a good teacher. He's not talking about that. He's talking about somebody who has the actual nature of God. In the Greek, it means substance. The same substance of God is the substance of Jesus. 
You're talking about God who takes on a body, God in flesh. This is who Jesus is. Though he is in the very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. He gave it up. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Can you imagine how derogatory it must be for God to take on flesh and blood? I mean, this is, this is going way down. But he didn't stop there. Being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself even further and became obedient to the death. And not just to death, the death of a cross, which was the worst form of execution and shame. We know God's great goal for us is that we would become like Jesus. We know that. So what are the ingredients of this love in Christ's example we are to emulate? He knew who he was. Look, I'm, I'm, I got rights. I am a strong person. I'm a leader person. I'm in charge. But he laid down his authority. He laid down all that he was. He laid it down. And he didn't stop. He kept going to the point that the leader who should be served becomes the servant. It's called leadership servanthood. It, he lays aside his needs to meet our needs. He empties himself no matter what it costs him. And John says, this is the kind of love we need to have with each other. This is what it means to really grow up, to really become like him. So let's apply Jesus' example to a broken relationship. Jesus taught us to lay aside our authority and our position, and I've got rights here, our power and willingly humble ourselves to another person with whom we have a broken relationship. Look, if he comes, she comes to me, it was her fault, she comes to me on bended knee, okay, I'll listen to what they have to say, and if it's good enough, okay, I'll forgive. No, he says, I want you to walk into this moment humble, humbled. Matthew 5, 23 and 24, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, who did the wrong thing? You did. Your brother has something against you because you did something wrong to him. That's the thought in the verse. Leave your gift in front of the altar. You go and get reconciled with that guy, with that girl. You go get reconciled with that person and then come and offer your gift. There is in the whole passage this idea that you go humbly and you go with the idea of restoration. You go with humility. You go with restoration in mind. Then notice what another, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, if another believer sins against you. Now, who's the wrong person? It's the other guy. It's the other guy. That guy sinned against me. Okay, I'm going to wait for that guy to come to me. No, that's not what he says. You go. Wait a minute. I go when I do wrong and I go when he does wrong? Yes, that's what he says. You go privately. Don't call someone up and say, uh, would you pray for me as I go to see this very bad human being? Let me tell you all the bad stuff about this human being so you can think the same way I think about them, and now pray for me as I go and try to reconcile. No, that's using prayer as gossip. No, don't do that. He says go privately. You go just to yourself. God will be there for, with you. Go privately to the other person. And point out the offense. Oh, I can't wait to do that. No, no. With humility and with the goal of reconciliation. And you know why? One reason why is because it may very well be that when you go to that person and you try to get some reconciliation and you go humbly, you'll discover that, that, that you offended that person down the road somewhere and this was an act of getting even with you that you may really have some skin in this game. 
you may have actually started this chain event. Now, you go with humility. You go with, with a willingness to reconcile. And if the other person listens and confesses, you have won that person back. In both of the stories, we're to go with humility and with the goal of reconciliation. Jesus' example is for us to humble ourselves to others with the desire to restore the relationship and when we confront, to do it lovingly with the willingness to listen and restore the relationship. Jesus teaches us to lay aside our needs to meet the needs of the other first. Did you see the, did you see the movie War Room? came out a few weeks ago. I went and saw it. Kathy and I went and see it together. It's a great movie. And here is this gal, this woman, and, and she comes to know Christ as Savior in the storyline, and she is mentored by someone, and she has got one no good husband. And this no good husband, she decides to do it God's way. And the most amazing thing happens, not only does she restore the relationship with him, but he comes to faith in Christ. His whole life is changed. Can I tell you something? It's easy to love people that love you. It's easy. Anybody can do this. It's what Jesus said. Anybody that does not know God can love people that loves them. But when we love someone who is stinking mean and stinking no good, I mean that figuratively speaking. You hear me? That's how we feel this moment that have treated us so wrong, and yet we love that person. No, not everybody can do that. Not anybody can do that, but someone who is filled with God's power. And Jesus said, this is how I want you to be. This is the kind of person I want you to be. Learning to put others before ourselves has to be one of the most difficult things, but the most mature thing we will ever do in our lifetime. And here is the bottom line. Here's what I want you to grab hold of. God the Father uses this moment in this whole story of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. He keeps on going, and he uses this moment to exalt his Son. He said, because of what you, you have done, my son, your name will be exalted above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is God to the, to the glory of his Father. And, and God exalts him because of his willingness to love in this way. Can I tell you, God blesses us when we choose to follow His example. The favor of God is on our life. The blessing of God is on our life when we choose to do the same thing. We cannot be saved by doing good works, but we are rewarded for doing good works. We're saved by the grace of Jesus and, and by the substitutionary atonement, the death of Christ for us. We're saved by Jesus, not by us, but we are rewarded with how we respond to life that mimics who Jesus is. So I'm asking you, who is it that you're mad at? Who is it that there is a broken relationship? Would you open your heart for God using the principles we've talked about? He has shown us to changing the relationship. There's some in this room who say, I, I'd never be able to do this. I don't even know Christ is my Savior. And the truth is, until you come to give your heart to Christ truly, not being religious, not doing what everybody else wants you to do and going through all the hoops, but you truly have accepted Christ into your heart, only then can the Holy Spirit of God come into your life and give you the power to do what we've just read. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today. We acknowledge the truth. And, oh, God, we fall short. God, would you move in our heart and we can think of the individuals, the relationships that are broken. Would you move in our heart to change the broken relationship? And we are the person that takes 
the first move because that's what you've taught us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.